founding. Arthur Anderson was born in the Shetland Islands in the town of Lerwick and was educated by his mother. At the age of 11 years old, he started his first job as a fish cleaner and at 12 years old started work in the clerical office. At 16 years old, he enlisted in the Royal Navy and was involved in the Napoleonic War. Paid off in Portsmouth at war's end, he made his way on foot to London and joined Brody McGee Wilcox as a clerk in his shipbroking business. Wilcox was born of English and Scottish parents and had started his business in 1815. A partnership was formed in 1823 between the two men and called Wilcox and Anderson Company and was aimed at carrying cargo and a few passengers on the Iberian Peninsula service. From the start it was all to be done with steam power and in this they were joined by Honorary Royal Navy Captain Richard Bourne and his Dublin partnership Royal Tar in 1834. In 1835, they chartered William Fawcett of 206 tons and started the new company, the Peninsula Steam Navigation Company, and thus started the famous company. The 1830s, two civil wars on the Iberian Peninsula between the Royal House of A. Spain and the insurrectionists and B. Portugal and their insurrectionists resulted in the company helping the royalist sides and not to put a too fine a point on it, good and running, a profitable adventure. It also resulted in the right being granted to fly two colours of each royal house and incorporate them into the house flag of the P&O company, still used today. That is the red and yellow of Spain and the blue and white of Portugal. In 1836, they added to their fleet Iberia, Braganza and Liverpool. And in 1837, tendered successfully for the mail contract from Falmouth to Vigo or Porto, Lisbon, Cadiz and Gibraltar. The steamer used was the paddle steamer Don Juan. <clears throat> On the first run, however, the whole venture nearly ended the company as she ran aground. On that is on the homeward bound run in thick fog on the rocks of Tarifa Lighthouse at the southernmost tip of the peninsula. Anderson had the males rescued by a fishing vessel and taken to Gibraltar and later rescued all the cargo and thus saved the company's reputation. The mail contracts were to prove the mainstay of the company's expansion and continued profit right into the late 20th century. In 1840, on the 31st of December, the company was incorporated by Royal Charter into the Peninsula and Oriental Steam Navigation Company, or p and and awarded a mail contract to carry the mails to Alexander, Egypt. And two years later, an overland route was established across the Egyptian desert and thus on another steamer to India. For the new service through the Mediterranean, two new ships were purchased and named Great Liverpool not to be confused with the earlier Liverpool of 1835, and Oriental. Two ships of 1,800 tons and 520 horsepower were ordered for the passage from Suez to Calcutta. And they were named Hindostan and Bentinic. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert visited the new Hindostan. Her Majesty was very impressed, and one could say she was most amused. Services to Singapore and Hong Kong were established in 1847, and to Sydney in 1852. And in 1862, the company decided to give up its original service to Gibraltar via 
the Iberian Peninsula. Cruising was invented by P&O, and in the year 1844, a newspaper advert was placed for a grand tour by sea from Southampton to Malta, Athens, Smyrna, Jaffa, and Alexander, using three different steamers on different lengths of the voyage. The ships were the Mary Wood, Tagus, and the Iberia. A famous literary giant, William Makepeace Thackeray, made this voyage and wrote about it later. Later cruises were undertaken by a more traditional means of using one ship for the whole voyage. Oriental started p and involvement with government trooping ships in 1840. By the Crimean War, p and had as many as nine ships involved in trooping. One famous personage of that area was Florence Nightingale, known as the Lady of the Lamp, who travelled on the ship Vectis. The first service to Penang, Singapore and Hong Kong was started from India as an ongoing service by the Mary Wood with the Braganza as her running mate. The start of the Australian service from India as an ongoing service was made by the Chusan of 699 tons in 1855. The new ship, a screw steamer of 2,126 gross tons called Perla, was also built for this service. However, she was not the first screw steamer that p built. That honour goes to Shanghai in 1851. An interesting note about Vectis is that she was later refitted and renamed Rome and carried 160 first-class passengers as a cruise ship. And p were very proud of the wonderful quality of their first-class service to the cruising passengers of this era. P and O, the Bombay route. P and O had a big rival for the Bombay route, and although they had the Calcutta route, the shorter route to Bombay was what they wanted. This route was held by charter by the huge East India Company, a big rival of P and O. The East India Company had been granted a charter in the year 1600 by Queen Elizabeth I and given the monopoly on trade beyond the Cape of Good Hope and Cape Horn. Powerful and wealthy and influential, it became even more powerful when given the right to annex land and make deals in India. It also built a number of forts, had its own private army, and own civil and criminal courts, and in actual fact, in reality, it governed India. Its influence had waned during the 19th century, and it was finished off by the Indian Mutiny of 1857, when its troops were so fed up with their bad, autocratic, bad treatment that they rebelled. The company was finished off and running of India was taken over by the Crown and British authorities and became part of the ever-spreading British Empire. p and had tried to tender for Bombay service in which the East India Company had the monopoly in 1849, followed by three more unsuccessful tenders, but achieved its goal on the 26th of February 1852 and the East India Company gave up the route to P&O. New builds of greater capacity ships was to follow over the next few years for the India service. New ships were built including Himalaya, Simla, Colombo, Manila, Candia, Ripon, Raja and Dubia. All these steamers were requisitioned in 1855 by the government for military service during the Crimean War and caused real problems with the mail service to Australia. This resulted in the contract for the service to be given to the newly formed company, European and Australian Royal Mail Service Company. p 
know, regained the contract in 1856 when the Simla was released from war service to the Crimea. She started off the reacquired mail contract service to Australia, followed by other steamers as they were released from war service. When the Suez Canal opened in 1869, the British authorities refused to let the mails go through the canal, as it was a provision in the contract that the mail would go by P&O over from Alexander to Suez. This awkward arrangement of the mail going overland while the ship passengers and cargo went through the canal lasted until 1874 when a new mail contract was signed between the British government and the P&O. So then the overland route was once and for all abandoned. The subsequent rebuilding of the fleet with 17 much larger ships to carry far more cargo then commenced. Some of the ships were as follows. Anora, 1,574 gross tons. Peshawar, that's 1871, 3,782 gross tons. Cathay, 1872, 2,984 gross tons. And Haidatspes, 1872, 2,984 gross tons, to name a few. Slightly later, Sumatra was acquired from the Sp a Spanish company to help with the service. With all its mail contracts and such, and such good reputation as THE company to travel to India on, meant that many colonial government officials and Indian army officers Plus also, the general travelling public chose P&O as the ships of choice to travel to India. P&O, 1880, the early 20th century. It is reported that P&O owned an astonishing 71 vessels in 1886. And they comprised of 50 ships, steam tugs, and launches. During the late 1880s and into the 20th century, many passengers, to avoid the rough waters of the notorious Bay of Biscay, chose instead to go overland to Marseille from London by going to a channel port and taking a ferry from Dover to Calais and joining a P&O special train to Marseille for the start of their voyage to onward port. P&O, seeing their chance of extra money, sold the empty berth on this leg of the voyage as a cruise. A new class of ship was built in 1880. The first one was Ravina, 3,511 gross tons, and was followed by Rahila and Rosetta. These were the first ships of all steel superstructure. Valletta and Marsilia II were the first ships fitted with electric lights, and later other ships were retrofitted with the new technology. Refrigerated cargo chambers in the holds and storerooms were fitted to all ships from 1883, and higher prices could be charged for shipping refrigerated goods. It also meant that all passenger supplies and provisions could be carried and the old practice of shipping livestock for slaughter on voyage could be abandoned. In 1887, a new class of four ships to celebrate Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee was constructed. The Victoria, Britannia, Oceana and Arcadia were 6,500 gross tons and were the largest and said to be the most luxurious ships built to date. When built, all four had gun platforms, with an eye on them being chartered to the British government as armed merchant cruisers in times of war. However, this did not actually work out, as all four ships never took up this role during their sea career. However, two of them, Victoria and Britannia, did do a long term.
long-term charter as troop transports before returning to P&O for further passenger service. In 1891, the road suffered a disastrous fire and had to be totally rebuilt and a length increased and given new triple expansion steam engines. Triple expansion steam engines have been pitted to all vessels since 1884. 1892 saw the Australia Second and Himalaya Second built of 6,901 gross tons. Australia was lost in 1904 in Port Phillip Bay on Corsair Rocks due to pilot error. Himalaya lasted to 1922 when she was scrapped and during her career was an armed merchant cruiser in 1916. 1896 saw the introduction of a new India class of ships of 7,899 gross tons. And two of this class were China and Egypt the second. Egypt was lost in 1897 when she collided with the steamship Seine and sank in the English Channel. She took with her one million pounds sterling of gold and silver bars. Between 1903 and 1911, ten new class of ships were built, starting at 9,500 gross tons. They were known as the M-class ships. They included the Mongolia, 1903, 5,505 gross tons, the Manara, 1903, 10,509 gross tons. The Macedonia of 1904, 10,552 gross tons. Later ones included the Maloja and the Medina. Marconi wireless systems were installed on all P&O liners from the first one aboard Mantua in 1909, another M-class liner and subsequently retrofitted to all existing P&O liners in the fleet shortly after. Here is an interesting fact. P&O had two ships called Ballarat. However, they were spelled differently. The first one of 1882, 4,762 gross tons, was spelled B-A-L-L-A-R-A-A-T. The second built in 1911 was the same spelling as the Australian town. In 1910, P&O bought the Blue Anchor Line, a company of emigrant and cargo ships who had lost their reputation in 1909 when their best and largest ship, Warata, of 9,377 ton gross tons, sank on a homeward run between Durban and Cape Town. Not a trace was ever found of wreckage, cargo, or passengers, or crew. P&O changed the name after purchase to P&O Branch Line. P&O's name was greatly enhanced in 1911 when the M-class ship Medina was chosen to be the Royal Yacht in 1911 to take King George V and Queen Mary to the Delhi Dubar. The ship's superstructure was changed from standard P&O black to a white hole with a broad blue band around the middle. Later, the Medina did cruising with its white superstructure, which is the origin of our white hole cruise ships of today. Well, that's all, folks, for this week. From Oscar, oh, and always remember...